it. Hello, everybody. Here we go. Test review part one. Ah. All right, so homologous structures. You guys remember what these are? Uh, homologous structures are structures that are similar between different species, right? So we have different species of primates here. Well, then baller. Actually, I just uploaded it this morning, so prom. But yeah, it's just, you've seen this, all these questions that you're going to see today, you've seen before. And these questions that you're seeing today, about half of them are going to be on the actual test because we're doing a two-part review. And this is going to be part one. Tomorrow's part two. And I'll take 10 questions from today, 10 questions from tomorrow, put them together in a 20-question test, which I've already done. It's not uploaded, but, you know, I've already done it. Okay. Uh, primate bones, don't they look very similar? They're just different sizes. What does that tell you? Does that tell you that they lived in similar environments? No. Now, correct, it is. Now, let me tell you, we already know that B is the answer because they share a common ancestor. Now, here's the thing. Remember, I'm only going to say this once, and then I won't harp on it anymore. Just because it says something that might be true doesn't mean it's the right answer. So A is probably true. They probably did live in similar environments. They probably did have similar diets. They probably did eat similar types of food. But you can't tell that from the correct. You can't tell it from the picture. You can't see what they ate. So remember to stick with the pick. So even though A might be right and D might be right, it's not mentioned in the picture. You don't pick it. You stick with it, whatever's in the picture, whatever it's telling you. Okay? So, A? No. Cameron, Mr. Cameron, you were wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the question here is I don't remember. I have to scroll down. The question here is which statement best provides the best evidence that this guy, or I'm sorry, this guy, the top guy, is an ancestor of this guy down here. Yes. So, well, what we're trying to say here is the more accurate way to say what you're talking about is that there's homologous structures in each fossil, okay? So if we... If you scroll back up and you look, you know, they look basically the same, only slightly modified, right? The older guy and the younger guy, very similar structures, only slightly modified. Those are homologous structures, okay? So that would be the best indication from this picture that we can see here that this guy is the ancestor of this guy. Uh, I don't know if that's around today. I don't think it is. Uh, now, once again, just like we talked about last time, there might be similar, there probably is similar nitrogen bases because that's DNA in each fossil, but we can't tell that from the picture. You stick with the pick. All right, we got a possum and a kangaroo. The fact that both of these mammals incubate their immature offspring in a pouch provides evidence that they are what? Do they belong to the same species? No. Of course not, because then they'd be the same animal, wouldn't they? Must range great distances to eat? Right. We can't tell that from the picture, right? We can't tell if they have to travel to eat, so we can get rid of that. Do they have very similar skeletal structures? No. Well, no. right, no. Well, I mean, plus we couldn't tell that anyway from this picture, could we? Even if they did, right? Yeah, so they are descended from a common ancestor. You're going to notice that common ancestor is a recurring theme. Okay, that's the whole point of studying evolution is to see common ancestry. Who's relate, related to who and how closely are they related? So which structures in figures two and three are homologous to structure C? in figure one. So this is the bone we are looking for, okay? So we have this big bone, and then we have two bones branching off of the big bone. The bone we're looking for is the bottom one. 
So we're just going to do the same thing in figures two and three. We're going to start with the big bone. Here's the big bone. And there's two bones branching off the big bone, a top one and a bottom one. We're looking for which one? The top one or the bottom one? The bottom one, right? Which one's the bottom one? V. Figure three, same thing. Tell me which one it is. Yeah, and figure three down here. O, right? Yeah, it's O. Yep, so the answer is B, right? O is the bottom bone. That is one of the two bones branching off the big bone. Same as V, same as C, right? Based on your understanding of anatomical homologies, which organisms most likely have a recent common ancestor? So we got three organisms. We got a bat wing, we got dragonfly wings, which you can't tell if you don't already know that, and we got a human arm. So which of these two probably have a similar common ancestor, or a common ancestor, I should say? One and three, right? Why not two? Good, because two doesn't have bones at all, right? At least one has bones, and three has bones. This one doesn't even have bones at all. Now, you might think, not maybe not you guys, but somebody out there might think that one and two are homologous because they're both wings, and this is an arm. And wings are more similar than arms because they're wings. But we're not talking about similarity in function. We're talking about similarity in structure, okay? you got to understand the difference. Function, these, these are both used for flight, yes. If I asked you which two have a similar function, one and two would be the right answer. But we're not asking similar function, we're asking similar structure, how it's built. Okay, which of the following structure pairs, which of the following structure pairs, pairs of structures, provides the best evidence of a common ancestor based on the anatomical similarities, meaning how they're made. No, it's definitely not D, right? Human eyebrows um, and ant antennas are not built any, uh, that in, in any way similar to each other. Uh, what about bee wings and bird wings? What? Right. Bee wings don't have bones, do they? Bird wings do. So they're not built the same. They might, once again, same function, different structure. Um, what about legs on a beetle and legs on a cat? Nope. Why? Same thing. Bones, no bones, right? So it's, it's got to be whale flipper and bat wing, right? Even though one's used for flying and one's used for swimming, again... Again, doesn't matter. They're built the same. Okay. Yeah, I know. But since I'm recording, I don't want to stop. If they need me that bad, they'll come over to the speaker. All right. Which organism is the least related to the other three organisms? So... This is a partial amino acid sequence. Remember that amino acids are what make up what? When you put amino acids together, do you remember what they make? It's a molecule, starts with a P. Remember proteins? Proteins are made up of amino acids. But where do the instructions on which amino acids to make and how to make them where do those instructions come from? There's a big giant double helix molecule that's just a big instruction booklet on how to build proteins, or more specifically, amino acids. What's that in molecule that has the instructions for how to build your body? I know y'all know. Big giant double helix molecule. What's the, what's the molecule that's a big giant double helix that's coded instructions? Yes, thank you. DNA, right? Oh, 
So DNA, the instructions for how to make the amino acids and which amino acids to make and in what order, those instructions are written in DNA. So if me and Connor have similar amino acids, that means that we must have similar DNA because the instructions for how to make those and which ones to make and in what order come from DNA, right? Okay. So, was that Miss one of your teachers trying to call me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Oh, it was Miss Haslin. Okay. All right. So, if the amino acids are the same, that must mean that the DNA is the same. So, by looking at amino acids, we can tell how similar the DNA is. So, which one of these four organisms has the least amount in common with the other three? Two, good, because organism two doesn't have any in common. If we look at these first four, none are in common, but if we look at the second one, one, three, and four have the second one in common. Uh, the third one, three and four have the third one in common. And the fourth one, one, three, and four have the fourth one in common. So two, organism two, doesn't have any in common with uh, the other three. Okay, so three and four are most closely related. Organism number one is in third place. Organism two is last place in terms of how closely related they are. Okay. All right, so once again, we're comparing DNA to try to figure out uh, how closely related things are. So uh, which conclusion about the readiness, I'm sorry, relatedness of the lizards do, does this data support? So these are seven different species of, liz of lizards. We've got seven species here, and then we've got those same seven species on this side over here, the same ones. The reason it's listed this way is because we're gonna compare this guy to the other ones, like this one, and this number here will tell us how many differences there are in the DNA between this guy and this guy. So the higher the number, the more the differences, the more the differences, the the further apart you are, as you're not, you're less related, right? Okay. So the question is, well, number one tells you, you're trying to figure out which one is true. Number one says Atlantica and Stellini are least closely related. So if they're least closely related, they should have the highest number of differences, right? So let's find Atlantica and Stellini. Here's Atlantica, here's Stellini. Where they intersect, that's the comparison. There's 36 differences. Are they the least closely related? Do they have the highest number of differences of any pair on this table? Or are there other pairs that have more differences? There are other pairs that have more differences, right? Yes. Right? Who has the most differences? Who's the least closely related because they have the highest number of differences? Well, 36 is the highest number. The highest number of differences. Yeah. <laughs> 49 is the highest number of differences. So Simone and Stellini are the least closely related, right? Now that wasn't the that wasn't the answer choice. I was just going over that because I wanted to make sure you understood how to read the table. What about Simone and Bravo? Are Simone and Bravo Anna the most closely the most closely related? Well, let's look at Simone right here. And Bravo Anna, 
where they intersect, which is right here. Now that's four, that's the number of differences. That's a low number of differences, right? So if they have few differences, that means they're more closely related, right? Is there a number on here that is lower than number four, that's less than four? I don't see any number on this table less than four, do you? So that means that out of these seven species, those two are the most closely related because they have the fewest amount of differences. So that's the answer. Simone and Bravo are the most closely related. That is true. Okay, which statement is best supported by the information in this dendrogram? All right. So it says lesser pandas are more similar to giant pandas. Are lesser pandas more similar to giant pandas than they are to raccoons? So are, is this guy more closely related to this guy than he is to the raccoon? No. no. Right? So it's not A. Let's look at the next one. Brown bears, are they more closely, are they more similar to giant pandas than they are to sun bears? So is this guy more closely related to this guy than he is to this one? No. Lesser pandas are more similar to raccoons. Are they more similar to raccoons than they are to giant pandas? Yes, they are, right? Check. So it is... There you go. It's just like looking at a family tree to see who's more closely related. All right. Genome maps provide the DNA sequences of the chromosomes. What do these genome maps allow the scientists to determine? What does this word genome mean? Well, it means genes, but genes are just sections of DNA, right? So when you see genome, we're just talking about DNA. So you can cross out genome and say, what do these DNA maps allow the scientists to determine? So when we're comparing DNA between, you know, organism one and organism two, and we compare the DNA between the two, what does that tell us? Does that tell us the color pattern of the offspring? Of course not. Does that tell you how much the size ranges in the two species? No. How they synthesize proteins? No. But how closely related the two species are to each other, right? That's what you get when you compare DNA. Just think of Maury Povich. Yes, you can. You guys get my Maury Povich joke? You are not the father. Comparing DNA, right? Looking at the DNA of the dad to the baby to see if they're the same, if they are, you are the father, right? All right, the occurrence of the same amino acid sequence. Once again, amino acid sequence. If you have the same amino acid sequence, it means you have the same DNA, right? So the occurrence of the same DNA in two unrelated species, meaning we got species A and species B, if there's similar DNA between species A and species B, what does that mean? These are two different species. Yes. This could be a dog and a cat, I don't know. But they have similar DNA, so what does that mean? Do they occupy the same niche, meaning they do the same job in nature? Not necessarily. 
Do they have analogous structures? I mean, maybe, but we can't tell that from this information given, right? Remember, stick with the pick. Stick with whatever they tell you. They descended from a common ancestor or they have evolved convergently? We never even talked about that. So it must be that, all right? So if you have species A and B and they have similar DNA, that means that at some point in the past, they came from the same ancestor. And it may not be the direct ancestor. It may be, that may be from another common ancestor, like group C, right? So they may not be from the same exact ancestor here, but maybe they're from, they have this ancestor in common or something else. But at some point down the line, they did have uh, a common ancestor. All right, so when looking at the fossil record, what conclusion can be made based on this evidence? Uh, none of the organisms are related. Are none of these organisms, why would they be even be on the same, they wouldn't be on the same line, would they? if not, they weren't related. All of these animals are related. That's why they're on the same family tree, right? Or the same branch of the family tree, at least. So it can't be A. We're gonna call this guy Tool. Tool is related to living tetrapods, but not to Tick. We're just gonna call him Tick. Let's look at Tool. Is Tool, which is right here, is he related to the tetrapods? Yeah, look, they're like cousins, right? Is he related to Tick? So, Tick is apparently not even around anymore, right? I mean, they are related in the past. Like if you want to say, yeah, this is his great, great, great grandfather, you could say that. So they're kind of related, right? But as of today, are they related? All right, so let's go ahead and look at the other options just to be safe. All of the organisms have a common fish ancestor. Well, yeah, right, they do. This one's very tricky because B, B is correct, okay? But C, honestly, C is more correct. So if you thought B was the answer, you're not wrong. But C is a more correct answer because all of the organisms, because this, remember how this is kind of debatable where we're, B is kind of like, well, it could be, or maybe it is, maybe it's not. But C is for sure, like you can't doubt C. C. They all do have a common fish ancestor because if you go back and you look, all of these guys, they all come from this point on the line here, right? Every single one branches from here. So the, this, whatever this is, we don't know what it is, but whatever this is, that's the common ancestor for all these guys. So oh, C is the correct answer. It's the most correct answer. Okay. Which statement is best supported by these data? Uh, is, was competition for food and shelter among reptiles very low during the Triassic period? Well, let's look at the Triassic period. That's the Triassic period. Was competition for food and shelter low? It probably was, but we can't tell that from the graph, can we? Okay, why do I say it probably was? Because early in the Triassic period, we had only a few species, but later on there was a lot, right? So if there's a lot of, if we go from, uh, 10 species to 1,000, and that must mean that there's plenty of food and resources available, meaning there's low competition, right? 
so it's probably not. Now, while F is probably true, we can't tell that from the graph. So let's let's keep looking. Uh, G says a great extinction occurred during the Jurassic period. So here's the Jurassic period, right? We have early and we have late. Notice what happened? We went from having a whole lot to very few. So that, uh, 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 it did happen. A, an extinction did happen during that time. And you can tell that by looking at the graph. So like I said, even though F is technically true, you cannot tell it from the graph. That's why we stick with the pick and only go with what the picture tells us, which is G. Okay, how can the pattern change in the fossil record best be explained? So here's the fossil record. Now remember that the fossil record, how the earth adds layers over time, like dead stuff, dead plants and animals fall on the ground and they literally add layers to the earth. So when we're walking around outside, we're walking on stuff like dead stuff from a long time ago. That's basically what that is. So the top layers are the new newest layers and the bottom layers are the oldest layers so the further you go down the more the further back in time you go so if we look at the lowest layer this is the oldest layer and we go forward in time we see the same types of shells through multiple layers of earth through this layer this layer this layer and this layer, all four of these layers have the same shell type. But then very suddenly, it shifts from that shell type, the small ones, to larger ones. Okay? And there was a rapid change that happened. So they were all small for a long period of time through multiple layers of Earth. Remember, it takes millions of years to create these layers. So for millions of years, um, these small shells were present and then suddenly, very suddenly, now they're all big. You're just picking the answer choice that says what we just said. They were all small for a long period of time, rapid change happened, and then they're big. So which one of those says that? F says the mollusks were well adapted to their stable environment. That's true. They were well adapted. That's why they lasted for millions of years. And then a large sudden change right here occurred in their environment. After the change, the mollusks with the bigger shells we're better adapted to the new environment. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yep, and we can stop there. That's all we have to read. All right. So we have a cladogram here. It says, which discovery would challenge the validity of this cladogram? Remember that a cladogram is just a timeline. So here we have the beginning of time and this up here is today. And this is all the time between the beginning and today. And everywhere you see an intersection, that's where something happened. So um, this was about 425 million years ago. It was right here. So about 425 million years ago, hornworts evolved. And then sometime later, these guys, and then the, so it's just a, it, it tells you in order who popped up and when. Okay. This was about 409, and this right here was about 380. 380 million years ago. Now, which one of these does not fit in with this graph? 
a large aquatic vascular plant about 200 million years old. So when did vascular plants show up? Right here, follow the intersections right here. Now it doesn't tell us what year that was, but we know it was between 380 and 409. So it was at least 380 million years ago, even longer. So if we find one from 200 million years ago, which would probably be somewhere up in here, that's not weird, right? That fits. So it's not A. B, a species of algae that has existed for less than a million years? Well, no, because algae have been around. Oops, sorry. Algae have been around since the beginning of time. So if we find one that, you know, was basically found way up here, that's not weird because they've been around since way down here. A moss species that has existed for less than 380 million years? Well, when did mosses show up? Mosses showed up about at least 409 million years ago, right? So if we find one that's 380 million years old, that's not weird. So we already know what the answer is because we ruled out A, B, and C, right? So the only one left is D, a fossil fern, a fossil of a fern more than 425 million years old. Why? Because ferns weren't supposed to have come around until sometime around 400 million years ago. If you find one that's older than 425 million years, well then... Now we have to change things around. All right, we're almost there. All right, so do you guys remember um, when we talked about different types of selection? I don't know if you guys remember this, but there's three types of natural selection. Okay, there's what we call directional stabilizing disruptive. The way you remember the difference is one, neither, and both. And when I say one, neither, or both, what I'm talking about are the extremes. What do I mean when I say extremes? I mean the extreme, the extremes that are on the spectrum, the opposite ends of the spectrum. Okay, so in this case, we're talking about length. We've got short, we've got long, and we've got somewhere in between. What are the two extremes? Well, the extremes are the opposite ends of the spectrum, meaning short and long, right? Those are the extremes. So in directional selection, one extreme is being favored over the other, just one. In this case, long is being favored over short, right? So in directional selection, only one extreme is being favored. In stabilizing selection, neither extreme is being favored, meaning short is bad, long is bad, medium is good. Neither, neither extreme. The one in the middle is good, but neither extreme. In disruptive selection, both extremes are good, meaning short is good, long is good, in the middle is bad. So in disruptive, both extremes are good. Okay? So now the question is, If there's a species um, that is undergoing stabilizing selection, stabilizing, remember which one is stabilizing? Is that where one extreme is favored, both extremes are favored, or neither extreme is favored? Here's stabilizing. Remember, short's bad, long is bad, medium is good. So neither extreme is favored. So if 
medium, if they're all medium, then they're all going to be medium, right? Then they're all going to look the same, right? You're not going to have half looking short and half being long. They're all going to be medium. So if in stabilizing selection, all the organisms should look the same. You ever notice how all squirrels look the same? You don't see squir some squirrels that are huge and some that are small. You don't see some that are black and some that are white. They're all the same color. They're all about the same size. You can't tell one from the other, right? Hmm? Well, babies, yeah, sure. But <laughs> So we would say a single phenotype. Remember, phenotype means a physical trait. A single phenotype, as in like medium, throughout multiple layers of rock, meaning over a long period of time, they were all the same because they were stabilized, stabilizing selection. All right, just a couple more. What is the best explanation of the pattern of evolution displayed in the cladogram? So without even reading the answer choices, can you guys tell me what happened here? Just explain what's happening. So we start off with, how many species do we start off with? The furthest to the left is the beginning because it goes left to right like you're reading it. This is, this is like a family tree. Who came first? Red, right? Okay. So, oh, geez. Okay, we're going to skip the moment of silence today. So, sorry. All right. Um, so, red was first, right? And then, from red, now this is, once again, this is like a family tree, okay? Okay, so green showed up, right? Who showed up first, green or blue? Green. Green, right? And then later on, blue showed up, right? Mm -hmm. Now, did red disappear? No. No, red's still around, right? So what happened was we started off with just red, green came around, then blue came around, but red was still around, right? Okay, it's kind of like just because I had kids doesn't mean I disappeared, right? So, B. solidus, that's a red guy. Red guy was well adapted to its environment. Obviously, must have been, or else it wouldn't have been alive. A change in the environment caused the sudden appearance of green guy and blue guy. After the change, all three species of butterfly were well adapted. Doesn't that sound like what's happening? Yeah. So, we can stop there. We don't have to read anymore. It's A. All right, and the next one, I believe, is the last one, or is there one more after that? Oh, this is the last one. Okay. All right, so what hypothesis is best supported by fossils found near the Pecos River? Again, you don't even have to read the answer choices. Before we do that, let's just, why don't you just tell me what is happening? So we have multiple layers of rock, we have two species. Species A is in this layer here, the one with the dashes. And species B, let's oh here. Let's call, let's label species B blue. What layer of rock is species B in? The dotted one, right? The speckled one? So which one came first? Which species is or was around on planet Earth first? Blue for B or red? 
Blue was around first, right? Why? Because it's further down in the fossil record, right? The lower levels, the lower layers of the fossil record are older. So species B was around first, but then later on in this layer, you find only species A. So which hypothesis best explains what's happening here? Obviously B was around, then B disappeared and A showed up. Uh, so were species A and B direct competitors for food? No, why? Because they weren't around at the same time. How could they compete with each other if they weren't around at the same time? B says the same thing. Species A and B were direct competitors for food. So we know it's not A, it's not B. A change occurred in the environment. Species A was not well adapted to the new environment. Species B was. So was it species A that wasn't well adapted and disappeared and replaced by B? Or was it the other way around? Who was around first? So if B was around, then B wasn't well adapted, and B disappeared and was replaced by A. All right, so um, there you go. So the correct answer must be D, right? B wasn't well equipped, died out, replaced by A. All right, and that's it.